Hi, I'm Damien, but nowadays most of you just call me Carol anyway. It appears that I've created a monster. Give my creation life! In today's video, we're going to answer a question. Is now a good time to start investing? A simple question born from complex concerns and one that's really easy to relate to. I actually think when people are asking this question, they're normally coming from two points of view, two original paths for that concern. A, they're worried something bad is about to happen, like England's current political situation or the world's, well, just the world's situation. Or B, they think they've just missed out, that the good times are gone, the party is over and that there's no point going anymore. And it's much better just to wait until the next one comes along. Well, today we're gonna to take a proper look at this. Put any fear or concern to one side and let's have an unbiased look at some data and facts. See if we can get this party started. Let's get it. I'll do it again. So the question is born of two concerns. That the past was the best of times and that the future holds the worst. But we can't predict the future and we definitely can't change the past. So all we can do if we ever hope to invest is address the fear and concern. First of all, let's start with the thought process that stops people investing that goes along the lines of the outlook for the economy at the minute is a bit bleak, so I'm not going to invest. Seems sensible, right? Why bother piling in now when you could just wait a few months and potentially get it for cheaper? This is called timing the market, basically waiting for the correct opportunity to buy in. And while it may sound simple, even the world's best investors acknowledge how hard this practice is. So the world's best investors say that time in the market is a fool's game, but the world looks like it's about to end. So do I just never invest then? Don't worry, I got this. In order to set your mind at ease, let me tell you a little story about three friends. Let's call them Rita, Bob and Sue. For no particular reason, other than when thinking of three names, the first thing that popped into my head was the charmingly British movie Rita, Sue and Bob 2. As a young boy, the movie was certainly eye-opening and clearly left a lasting impression. The actual study I'm referencing was compiled and documented on Reddit. I just changed the names for witness protection. Don't worry, I'll link any references in the description below for you, so you can check them out for yourself if you like after the video. But for now, let's get back to Rita, Bob and Sue too. Three friends all come together one day to discuss investing. They understand it's a good thing to do for their financial futures and agree to invest £96,000 each, which works out at about £200 a month for 40 years. They all agree buying an index fund like the S&P 500 is a solid strategy as it provides lots of diversity in one purchase. But the one thing they couldn't agree on is when to invest. Rita and Bob were of the mindset that they should time the market, that each month they should collect their £200 and build up pots of cash, and when the opportunity was right, pounce on the market with those pots of cash. Whereas Sue, being characteristically lazy and not very technically minded, didn't want to go through all that hassle, and thought that the best way to go about it would be just to invest her £200 every single month on the day she's paid. After some heated exchange and debate, they agreed to disagree and parted ways. Fast forward 40 years and the friends are sat around a table discussing their performance and who was ultimately right. Remember, each of the friends invested the same amount of money over the same time period in the exact same investment. The only thing that differed between them was when they purchased the investment. Bob had a stinker. He tried to time the market, but every single time he purchased at the worst possible point. Always at the top of a market, just before it crashed. But he isn't too upset as the 96K he started with is now worth £663,594. And this is the guy who bought at the worst times. He still made an absolute fortune. Rita is very smug. She is the master of timing. She saved up her $200 a month and only purchased at the exact bottom of each market. Literally, you couldn't have timed it better. So it isn't surprising to see she beat Bob and has a cool £956,838. It would annoy me personally that that's not a million. Rita reclines back in her chair, smug at her own ability to time the market perfectly and confident she will have won in terms of overall market performance. I mean, what could be better than investing consistently at the bottom of the market? Sue sits there quietly, remembering the conversation she had 40 years prior and how her idea of just investing the £200 every month was discredited as lazy and foolish. But Sue gets the last laugh. 
as that slow and steady approach has landed her a total investment value of £1,386,429 from her initial £200 a month. How surprising is it that someone who invests consistently on a monthly basis beats the person with perfect market timing? It's kind of mind-blowing. But the reason for this is, while Rita was hoarding money on the side ready to invest at the best possible time, Sue's money was in the market working for her, outstripping the return that Rita was getting on her cash that was sat to one side doing nothing, quite frankly. This is startling evidence for the argument of consistently long-term investing, and the results are clear and don't need that much explaining. But there is something else this study makes me think about, and that is the psychology of investing. When someone asks me, is now a good time to invest? Their concern is, if they invest now and they get it wrong, they've somehow messed up forever. If you're Bob or Rita, I can understand that mindset, because you're only making a few investment decisions over the course of your whole life. Four or five times you're purchasing shares, and if you do it wrong, it's gonna have a big impact on the outcome. But what if you sue and you invest every single month? Does having one bad month seem that bad? Relating this to a meal, which I do a lot. <laughs> Imagine the pressure if you had to pick the last thing you ever ate. Death row inmates get to choose their last meal. Interestingly, the most common choice is fried chicken. The decision of choosing your last meal while facing the gravity of the wider situation makes picking this meal seem like the most important choice ever. Take that very same decision of picking a meal but instead of death row as the backdrop, instead, frame it in the context of your commute home from work. You fancy a pizza tonight, but the steaks in the fridge that need eating. Okay, no big deal, I'll have pizza tomorrow. Only investors who don't invest consistently, who don't get to eat again, have this death row pressure of making sure they make the right choice. It's my opinion that if you do invest consistently, this really doesn't need to be a concern. If you're worried about getting started investing because of perceived issues that may cause the markets to drop, try not to think of it as, I can choose three to four moments in my life to invest and I better get the decision right. Think of it more as, you invested last month and the markets have dropped, but that's okay because I'm going to invest next month and the next month and the next month and the next month. All you're doing is starting out on an investment journey that will probably last for years. In years to come, it will not matter that the very first investments that you made were not at the very best possible time. To further hammer this point home, the lovely people at the Tilney Group did a study. What they looked at was, if you were the unluckiest investor of all time, so you only invested five times throughout your life, £10,000 each time, and every single time you purchased, you bought at the height of the market, right before a collapse. Literally the worst possible time to invest every single time. These are the worst dates that you could have invested. And these are them plotted on a chart. I ran out of black ink, so I had to finesse it a little bit here with a black Sharpie. <coughs> and my man Bob bought on the day, first in line, full price just before the sale. Regardless of this, that £50,000 will be worth £220,000 today. So this guy bought at the very worst possible times and still forexed his money. And investing consistently on a monthly basis and paying no attention to what's going on in the market outperforms someone who invests in the same index fund but focuses on market timing. What are you waiting for? Because I can tell you something for now, any money that you're not investing, you are losing money on at the rate of whatever inflation is that year. So by not investing and having cash sat there in a savings account, you are guaranteeing a loss. So if that doesn't convince you to put the fear of investing to one side and get started, let's say you think I'm wrong and you think, okay, well, investing over the long run, I understand smooths out the cracks, but it still makes sense to get started at a good point. So I'm gonna wait until the next dip, which I think is around the corner, so that I can give my early investments a boost. Well, to you, I say take a look at this. On screen is a chart showing the effects of missing just a few days of the best days in the market and what that does to overall gains. You invest in 1980 and hold the money until now. Over that time period, the markets move slowly day to day. They ebb and flow like a slow moving ocean. But every so often, the winds pick up and things get a bit mental. Ups and downs everywhere. It's normally at this point that people start asking, is investing worth it? And it's at this point that people miss out on those best days. I mean, take a look at the chart. If you miss just the 10 best days in the market in 38 years, 
you lose half of your cash. 13,870 days, and if you miss just 10 of them, you get half the cash at the end. We are not stock experts, and we're certainly not gifted enough to identify the 10 very best days to invest out of a potential nearly 14,000 days. But the message here isn't about picking the best days to invest. The takeaway is that you need to make sure that you're invested when those best days happen. We've shown by the Tilney study and with Rita, Bob and Sue, that even if you invest in the very worst points in modern history, you still make a shed load of cash. But if you miss just one or two of the best days, you risk most of your cash. So surely the conclusion for today's video has to be, it's more important to have our money in the market working for us than it is to worry about day-to-day -day pricing. We wanna make sure when the party rolls up to town, we already have a ticket. We invest consistently on a monthly basis so the investments we place month to month are never so big that it's a concern. We won't take a simple habit like eating a meal and turn it into a death row decision. We will get to eat again, just like we'll get to invest every month. And if the market does tank in the short term, we don't care because we understand it's more damaging for our performance missing the best days than it is buying at the worst. Let that sink in. Now watch this drive. I do it again. Add it up, add it up, bankroll, bankroll, euro, euro, peso, peso, add it up, add it up.